Good morning. My name is Megan Howard. I'm an assistant chief with the Houston Police Department, and I'm here today with Commander Hardy from the West Side Division. This morning, Houston police officers received a call for service about a shooting that just occurred in the 13400 block of Preston Cliff Court. Uh, the information in the call slip was limited. The caller indicated that there were two gunshot victims and the suspect was still inside of the residence. The suspect was, uh, was going to be the, a relative, a family member of the two gunshot victims. Officers arrived. They met a 13-year-old child outside who relayed information to the officers, indicated that the father shot her mother and her sister and everyone was still inside. Um, officers Fearing for, uh, fearing for the safety of the victims who were inside, uh, knowing that time was of the essence to make sure that they had a, ch a chance to survive, they made entry and they began to clear the house. Uh, they followed their training, they looked for threats, they did things methodically, um, but they were very aware of their surroundings and eventually one of the officers came upon a door with a hand that was uh, signaling from underneath the door. Um, so they established uh, some kind of unspoken communication with that person while they continued to clear and make sure that there was not some other threat other than what was behind the door. And they gathered that the suspect, along with both of the gunshot victims, were still inside of that room. Uh, all this happens within just three minutes. Officers, um, uh, they were just about to announce their presence. And at that time, they heard a single gunshot. Uh, fearing the worst, they forced entry without regard for their own safety uh, because they knew that they had two innocent victims who were inside. They found an adult male who had what appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Um, they also saw two, two women who had gunshot wounds. They uh, began to render aid, called for medical assistance. HFD was already en route to the scene, but they were calling them up. Um, and that's basically where this part of the, um, the news briefing will end. Uh, we do have two, uh, two family members, uh, the mother and an adult daughter who have been transported to an area hospital for treatment for gunshot wounds. Um, the mother has a, uh, what, what was originally reported to be a gunshot wound to the head or neck, uh, appears to be a non-life-threatening wound, uh, still in the head, but non-life-threatening. Um, the adult daughter has a wound, where was the wound? Uh, in, the, in, the arm, in the upper arm. Uh, again, officers rendered aid, they applied a tourniquet, they applied pressure to the head wound, um, and so then they, they followed their training, got them out of there for medical treatment, um, and this is where we stand. At this point, we're going to have parallel investigations. There's an, an administrative investigation along with a criminal investigation, um, and you know, I would, I would just like to say this first. Uh, the first heroes on scene are going to be the survivors. Um, Family violence is something that impacts all communities, regardless of uh, income or, or status. Um, and so they called for help, went through a harrowing situation, and they're going to have a long road to recovery. This event will stay with them the rest of their lives. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the incredible work of the officers who arrived on scene. They only had three minutes from the time that they arrived, gathering information about a rapidly unfolding incident. They were, they had care and concern for the survivors who were still inside, and there was a lot of unknown information. They did not know the status of the suspect, did not know exactly where he was, uh, and there, were just a, there was just a lot of information that would have been helpful, but there was not time to get that information in order to make decisions about what they were going to do. They followed their training. Um, this is preliminary information, have not had a chance to review body cameras, but to hear the officer's side of the story. And, uh, and their thought process as they worked through what was in front of them, trying to work through possible tunnel vision, auditory, auditory exclusion, all of the things that cause physical challenges when you respond to critical incidents, um, they just performed admirably. And no doubt, thanks to their efforts, uh, the survivors are here. They will, uh, they will have a chance to recover from this and, uh, and move forward. So that's where we're at today, and I'll take any questions. So the 13 year old, she was the one that called 911. How did she survive or avoid? So I'm, I'm not 100% sure who called 911. It appears that one of the adult victims who was still inside actually made the phone call and the 13 year old was able to escape, get out of the residence and to speak to officers as they arrived. So what was the second part of the question? The second part was uh, how, so was she, was she, the 13 year old, was she in a different room in the house? Not, not sure. It's, 
we, it's preliminary information, not sure exactly what kicked off the disturbance that started tonight. Not sure why this event unfolded, what triggered the suspect, um, which could have been nothing. And that's the truth about family violence cases. Um, the suspects often make excuses for why they behave and they place blame on others. But there's no one to blame other than the suspect in this case. And we just don't have the details at this point about what transpired prior to the officer's arrival. And those four family members, those were, those were the only people that were in the house at the Yes, the yes. And so, like you said, uh, moving forward, uh, the crime scene investigators still out here a couple hours after this event unfolded. So just talk about what they're, what they're doing at this point. Yes, so we're gonna we're gonna fully process the crime scene. Uh, there's both the administrative and the criminal investigation. Uh, Harris, Harris County Forensic Science Center is going to process the scene, uh, do all the crime scene processing. Uh, the medical examiner will retrieve the body, take it back for an autopsy, and this is going to go through all of the all the processing that you normally see for a homicide scene. Um, so even though he died by gunshot wound, appears to be self-inflicted, we're going to cast a wide net, fully process it, make no assumptions, and see and make sure that the evidence matches information that we've been told, and there's going to be a full, thorough investigation. It takes some time to analyze everything that we have. Um, you know, it starts with the uh, evidence techs who are going to, you know, have precise me measurements, photography, video. They're going to do all, you know, take lots of measurements to process the scene and have an accurate picture of exactly what is here right now and then try to figure out what led up to this final state. Um, so the 13 year old, just real quick, so 13 year old and then the ages of the two other victims. Right, we're gonna have a middle-aged female and we're gonna have another female who's in her late 20s. And what was the age of the, uh, of the, sh the shooter? The, the decedent, I, he's gonna be middle-aged. Uh, the car in the parked up front, is, does that have to do anything with that, or is that was just, it's just been there? Uh, that I'm not sure about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, he's not been transported. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, Chief, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.